another one to do after this. Okay. Good, Good morning, morning and happy Sabbath. And Merry Christmas. And for those who speak French, Joyeux Noël. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Byron, do you want to start us off with prayer? Yes, let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with humble hearts. We come with, to you, Lord, with the desire to learn, to learn more about you, to learn more about these end times and this, this judging process, Lord. It truly affects whether we have eternal life or whether we cease to be for all eternity. Lord, we ask for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we may speak your words, Barbara and I, that we may not only speak your words, but that your spirit may touch the hearts and minds of all those that listen, that your word may be clear, understood, and Lord, the message you want to be delivered is to each individual. We thank you for the mercy and grace that you give us, Lord, and we thank you that you guide us each step of the way. We place our faith and trust in you in all things and pray this to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, Lord. So today, um, this, this week's lesson is about the judging process. So our memory text is, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things we have done in the body, whether good or bad. And we all get to stand before the judgment throne. <clears throat> if scripture is clear about one thing, it is the reality of the judgment. God will judge the world. The texts both in the Old and New Testament are numerous and without ambiguity. The justice so lacking here and now will one day come. Nearly all Christian religions believe in some form of judgment. They range from ever-burning hell to we're all in heaven, no matter what we believe and how we lived. So <clears throat> somewhere... The true answer is there, and so when we want to know what that answer is, we go to the Bible, don't we? Amen. The Bible says that God has perfect knowledge. Job 37, 16 says, Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? So he has perfect knowledge. He also knows everything. <clears throat> 1 John three twenty says, God knows all things. And thirdly, including he includes including he knows our most secret intentions. Ecclesiastes 12:14 says for God will bring every work into judgment including every secret thing whether it be good or evil. Jeremiah 17:10 says the Lord searched the heart I have test I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. We can hide from everyone and everything else, but nothing is hidden from God. So what this reality implies is that he does not need a judgment for himself to know the life of each individual. God's judgments are indeed divine accommodation carried out for the sake of his creatures, both in heaven and earth. This process is a cosmic, historical nature because Lucifer began his rebellion in heaven and then it spread to this earth. Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought with the, with the angels. And they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer so great so the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan who deceived the whole world he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him fortunately it's god who who is our judge we see that in isaiah 54 3 as our judge he's impartial in the judgment the good news is as fallen beings with imperfect judgment and a tendency towards partiality and prejudice, we transport some folks into heaven and then refuse others' entry. 
But God knows the human heart and think, our thinking and our motives, and he alone can deliver every human being an unbiased and just sentence. And as God does that, his character is vindicated. Through his judgment, he restores his glory <clears throat> and vindicates his character. That's one of the things that we need to remember. <clears throat> the judgment is not about us. We are just part of the battle. The, 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 the battle is really about God's character. He does so openly and consistently so that everyone can know who he is. God wants all intelligent beings in the universe to understand his purpose and to know that he deals with evil fairly, punishes the wicked appropriately, and saves sinners justly. The gospel, according to God's judgment, focuses on the salvation of the repentant sinners and thus presents the good news. Just, just, thus presents the good news of, of salvation and that God is love. Um, the best news is that in the end, God will restore harmony and peace throughout his entire universe. Evil and everything who is associated with it will be eliminated and even destroyed. Everyone who totally and voluntarily submitted to God, acknowledging him <clears throat> as his, his, their, his or her creator, redeemed in the Lord and King, will receive everlasting life, joy, serving and worshiping him forever. Thus the orind, original abundant life, joy, happiness, and peace will be restored, never again to be disrupted by the soul. <clears throat> The Desire of Ages, Ellen White <clears throat> is, is, uh, tells us in this um, uh, text <clears throat> or in this paragraph that she, she writes, uh, Christ is speaking to Caiaphas and he says to him, uh, Hereafter, said Jesus, Shall ye see the sin of Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven? In these words, Christ presented the reverse of the scene then taking place. He, the Lord, the life and glory, would be seated at the right hand of God. He would be the judge of all the earth, and from his decision there could be no appeal. Then every, th every secret thing would be set in the light of God's countenance and judgment be passed upon every man according to his deeds. These words of Christ startled the high priest. The thought that there was to be a resurrection of the dead when all would stand at the bar of God to be rewarded according to his works was a thought of terror to Caiaphas. He did, the, he did not wish to be rushed. He did not wish to believe that the future he would receive a sentence according to his works. There rushed before his mind a panorama of scenes of the final judgment. For a moment, he saw a fearful spectacle of the graves giving up their dead with the secrets he had hoped would be forever hidden. For a moment, he felt as if standing before the eternal judge, whose eye, which seizes all, was reading his soul, bringing light, mystery, light bringing to light mysteries supposed to be hidden from the dead. So, as we see, <clears throat> the time will come for us, for us all to, to stand in the judgment. And I just want to finish up by, is it, um, I think there's a millennium chart. Can we get that up? And we see the judgment. The judgment is, and, and we'll go through it in detail today, but I just want to do a quick overview so initially, it's Christ's return, the final days of earth's judgment. The investigative judgment has ended. Probation is closed. The saints are taken to heaven. The living wicked are slain, and Satan is bound on the earth. During the thousand years, the saints reign with Christ. The executive judgment is, uh, is, takes place where the saints participate in the, the judgment. The wicked remain dead, and Satan and his angels are bound. And then the final phase of the judgment, Christ descends with the holy city and the saints. The wicked dead are resurrected. The wicked come against the city 
wicked judgment is executed and a new heaven and a new earth is created. Amen. Yeah, so that's going to be an exciting time. And so, Byron, you're going to talk to us about the final judgment. Final judgment. Today's lesson <laughs> is called the final judgment, Sunday. And the word final means the completion of all judgment. As discussed in the previous lesson, we know that there is no immortal soul. The breath of life plus the body equals a living soul. And that's the only soul there is in the Bible, period. Sounds ominous, though, doesn't it? The final judgment. That depends on what side of the judgment you end up on. Say I'm on trial for a heinous murder. Something really bad. All the evidence is presented and weighed without bias. Let's say the judgment could go one of two ways. Guilty, and I'm sentenced to go to death row and die myself. Or not guilty, and I'm free to go without having to worry about ever being charged with this again. And I can continue on with my life. Now both are a judgment. Which one would you choose? That's pretty simple, right? Not guilty. Mm -hmm. These are the, this is just it though. The guilty face condemnation and the guilty and the not guilty do not. So you see the difference. Even though they're both judged, one, well, they both have consequences, but one are good, one is good and one is not so good. So we have the law of God that we live by. That's what we are judged against. Essentially, the Ten Commandments, which represent the very character of God. Our life, how we live it, is evidence that will be presented in our judgment. Our judge is Christ. And the Greek word krisis, which means legal decision, verdict, condemnation, or justice, many times it can have negative connotations to judge as guilty or to condemn but it depends on the context on how it's used in the Greek. For Jesus himself said, and that's John 5, verses 21 through 29. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son of Man to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. That would be a reward of the judgment or execution of it. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And we're going to talk about that word judgment because... There's other variations of that well. It depends on how it's interpreted. Verse 25. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. We're going to get into that execution of the judgment later on in the lesson here. But um, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, that would be one judgment, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. By the way, that word judgment and the word condemnation are that same word, krisis. So if we look at this, if we look at 524, that verse, it could also be read, all shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death into life. In other words, not judgment, but you are actually past that part of condemnation. John 3.18 would also be a good example of this. He who believes in him is not condemned, 
But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So I hope that makes it clear about judgment. We could look at the example of the sheep and the goats as well in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. But we're just going to read uh, two verses out of that. Verse 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We would see that as a judgment and not only the decision, but the execution of it. And we would see Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say, also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That would be the other form of the judgment. There's only two that God is going to do, that Christ will actually do. They say that nothing is certain except death and taxes. I'm going to have to disagree, but I will tell you this. The only thing that is set in stone certain to occur is that each one of us will be judged by God, specifically Jesus. Because at the close of probation, when Jesus comes in the clouds with all the host of heaven, there will be those alive who have not paid taxes yet or passed away. Think about it. So why are we so afraid of the judgment? It strikes a chord of fear almost to most people. Oh, judgment, they just shudder. We know God's law, and if you've ever heard God has written his law on our hearts. So if you don't know about Jesus, if you don't know about the God of the Hebrews or way back when, he still writes it on your heart so you know right from wrong. We know this even in remote Amazonian tribes. They have words for good and bad, for murderer. How did they get this? So Hebrews 4 verses 14 through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So our judge has literally gone through everything that we have. We have a more sympathetic judge than I think we will ever have. He judges fairly. He judges without bias. But you say, I've sinned. You know, I've walked away. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. And 1 Peter 4, 8 says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. These are all wonderful things to hear, right? So what's the catch? The catch is this, Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And what he says there in Scripture, he doesn't really mean hate. It's just who do you put first? Who is it that's your priority in your life? Have you put Jesus and his teachings first in your life? We need to do that because that is what is right and just in this world. For those that do, the final judgment is something to earnestly yearn for because they already know how they will be judged and what the execution or really a war, reward of that judgment will be. Is that a promising thing? Everyone who says, oh, the judgment. No, it's actually, if you're walking with God, it's a glorious thing. It is. So we're going to move now to the pre-advent and the pre advent judgment is something that people often struggle with a little bit. But we're going to go through some, a number of scriptures uh, in the next few minutes that show us why, the ad, why there is a pre advent judgment. And we're going to start with Daniel uh, 7, 9 through 14. 
And we're going to see in these scriptures that three times Daniel says, I watched. And we're going to look at, as he watched, what happens. <clears throat> in Daniel 9, he says, I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garments were white as snow, and the hair on of his head was of pure wool. His throne a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a, fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands ministered to him, ten thousands and ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So in this first part where he says, I watched, we see a courtroom scene. Verse 11, I watched. Then because of the, sound, then because of the sounds of pompous words, which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain. So while the court is in heaven on this earth, Daniel is watching while the beast is slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a, a little season and a little time. So we see this judgment while, while things are still going on on this earth. And he gives in verse 13, he says, And I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days and brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. So we see that this, this judging takes place prior to Christ receiving his kingdom, that all people's nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one that shall not be destroyed. So three times he gives us this sense of completeness. Then if we look at one of the parables that Christ gave in Matthew 22, 1 through 4, he was talking about the kingdom of heaven, starting in verse 2, is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call and invite those to the wedding. But they weren't willing to come. And so we see as we go through this, uh, this parable that, the, that um, his, his servants were treated horribly and killed. But when the king heard about it, he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up the city. Then he said to the servants, the wedding is ready, but those who are invited are not worthy. And then in verse 9, he says, therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you can find, invite to the wedding. So we see that he went to those he knew first, and then when, that did, when, when they destroyed the servants, then he went out into the high, highways and byways. And so then in jumping down to verse 12, he said to him, um, well, the king came to review the guests, and he looked at uh, the servants, and one of them was without a wedding garment. And so we can see that he examined the, the attendees of the wedding prior to the wedding. And this, when, when, the, um, when the person was without the wedding garment, the king told him to bind the hand and foot and take him away and cast him into darkness. He says, many are called, but few are chosen. So then let's take a look at another scripture, Revelation 11, 1, 18, and 19. Then there was given a reed, a measuring reed, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. So when you talk, look at about and looking about reeds and measuring, what you're looking at is judging. You're measuring the, the worth. So the nation was angry, and your wrath has come, and at the time that the dead should be judged. So we see that the nations are angry when it's time to judge the dead, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of, of God was opened in heaven, and the ark whose covenant was seen in his temple, and there was lightning, noises, and thunders. We know that when the ark is only seen at one point in the year, and that's on the Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. 
And so we see this, <clears throat> this judging taking place while men are still on the earth. Revelation 16, 21 says, And a great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone the weight of a talent. So we see as we jump down here to verse 21 um, that, that there's this, the, the talent. And so since we know that that's the time of the plagues, we also know that the, the judging starts before that. And Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel preached to the earth, to every kingdom, tribe, and nation, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. So as we walk through Revelation, we can see the different, um, the different uh, times that these events take place, and we can see that man is still on the earth while this judging takes place. Um, so the, the pre-advent ju pre judgment is, is in, based on three teaching. One is that the notion, one is the notion that all the dead, righteous and unrighteous, remain unconscious in their graves until the resurrection. And we see that in John 5.25. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead will appear, will hear the voice of God, and who here will live. And 26, for the Father has life in himself. He has granted his Son to have life in himself. And so he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Secondly, the existence of a universal judgment for all human beings. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And Revelation 20, 11 through 13 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on the throne from the face of the earth, and the heavens fled away, and there was no place found for him. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before, the, before God, and the books were open. And then we see, and then the sea gave up her dead, and Hades, and delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to their works. The third fact is that the resurrection will be the blessed reward for the righteous, and the second resurrection will be eternal death for the wicked. And uh, John 5, 28 and 29 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth, those who have good done, done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So the book of Daniel helps us to understand both the time and the nature of the pre-advent judgment. And we see uh, in Daniel the 2300-day prophecy where the heavenly sanctuary is cleansed and the pre-advent investigative judgment would begin when it would begin. And um, two different ways of expressing the same event, judgment is in favor of the saints. We see that in Daniel 7 as well and that it is good news for the people. In Matthew 22, uh, 1 through 14, Jesus spoke of an, of an investigation of the wedding guests before the feast it actually started. We talked about that. In the book of Revelation, the pre-advent investigative judgment is referred to as the task of measuring. You know, and it starts in God's house. It starts with God's people, yes. Oh, boy. So let's look at Tuesday. The millennial judgment. So when Jesus comes, we know that the dead will be raised incorruptible and immortal with glorified bodies. And we know that God is the only one who can give that immortality. Those that are alive will see this before being transformed and translated themselves. And all will meet the Lord in the air. But what comes after that? Well, we know that Ellen White writes that seven, it takes seven days to get to heaven. And we know that's symbolic of the wedding week in the Jewish culture. So that is the, the marriage of the, the lamb and the church. And then what happens after that? I'm sure that there will be loved ones you'll meet in heaven. They'll be re reunited when all the saved will be speechless about the wonders of heaven and all these things. The stories they will tell. But what does scripture say? 
Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is part of the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. But in the very beginning in verse 4, it says that judgment was committed to them. So what judgment? I mean, we can see that either you're in heaven or you're not. But, so Revelation 20, verses 11 through 13. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works." We see this, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 through 3, Paul says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Huh. And, that, and if the world will be judged by you, you are more unworthy to judge, or you are, more, are unworthy to judge the smallest matters? And he's asking that question. This all originated because they were taking these petty little things to to basically public court. And he's like, don't you realize you'll be judging angels someday. I'm sure you guys can handle this. And it says, do you not know that you shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? And before, actually the very last part in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, we already touched on this. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will bring forth to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. So bottom line, during this judgment, there is nothing that is left undone. There's no trail of evidence that won't be exposed or evaluated, even the thoughts of your heart. But wait, the judgment already happened, like I said earlier, right? And we have those saints that are saved in heaven, and we have those that are waiting for the eternal death. True, but the execution of that judgment for the righteous has already been done with the saints in heaven, with Jesus. But there's another execution of judgment that needs to happen. That's the second death. And not one single thing is hidden any longer for, that, for everyone knows what's been done. Ellen White writes in heaven, page 119, it is at this time that, as foretold by Paul, the saints shall judge the world, that was 1 Corinthians 6, 2, in union with Christ, they judge the wicked, comparing their acts with the statute book, the Bible, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. The, then the portion which the wicked must suffer is meted out according to their works, and it is recorded against their names in the book of death. So what this means is the judgment's already been executed. It's kind of like a court case. The verdict's already been proclaimed, right? And they've been proclaimed as guilty. So what comes next? The sentencing. What is the punishment for the crime committed? And that's the judgment that actually occurs during that thousand years. So the saints in heaven will actually play a part of that. I know this was news to me. We will cover in Thursday's lesson 
that during the second death, some will burn instantly and be no more, while others will burn for days. It's all dependent on your deeds. And that length is determined during this thousand years. Just like there is sentencing with the guilty verdict, as we said. So that second death will be dependent on this. Ellen White writes in The Great Controversy, Now the event takes place foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the Day of Atonement. Before we go forward, we have the Great Disappointment, which was in 1844, right? Correct. And that is the first phase of the temple service before the Day of Atonement. That's the regular sacrifice. After 1844, with the investigative judgment, we've moved into the second phase, and that is the phase of the, that's a type of the Day of Atonement. And so we see this to where this is where sins are actually cleansed away that have been repented and forgiven, and they're literally wiped away as if they don't exist. On the, and this is symbolic now as we look at it in the thousand day, in the thousand years, in the millennium. Now the event takes place foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the Day of Atonement when the ministration of the Holy of Holies had been completed. And the sins of Israel had been removed from the sanctuary by virtue of the blood of the sin offering. Then the scapegoat was presented alive before the Lord. And in the presence of the congregation, the high priest confessed over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. And all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. That's Leviticus 16.21. In like manner, when the work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary has been completed, then in the presence of God and the heavenly angels and all the host of the redeemed, the sins of God's people will be placed upon Satan. He will be declared guilty of all the evil which he has caused them to commit. And, and as the scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, so Satan will be banished to the desolate earth, an uninhabited and dreary wilderness. Satan will not only pay for his own sin, but he will also pay for the sins that Jesus has forgiven of the saved. That's going to be some sentencing, huh? Also remember, this thousand years is to vindicate God's character. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they know everything. We know this. They're all powerful, all knowing, and ever present. The angels and saints, however, do not. This is also the judgment of God's character before the inhabitants of heaven and the entire universe. This is where we get to see why some people are in heaven and others are not. This is where God is fully transparent to everyone. His character, all of his decisions, all show just how just and true he really is and all the accusations of Satan, how wrong they really are. The great controversy is almost completed at the end of that thousand years. And we don't have time, but if you want to read just to see how far Satan has fallen, read Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 17. Because it really shows he once had the world in his hand and now he's on earth powerless and locked in prison to realize his fate. Thank you. So now we're going to jump to the executive ju uh, uh, portion of the judgment or the where everything's actually executed. So if we look back over time, if we look at the Middle Ages... We've, it, it tended to portray God as a severe and punitive judge. You don't do what's right, sizzle fits. You're He's done. Got a fist ready to come down on oh, wow. Well, yeah. Now, today, it's completely flip flopped. And there's a tendency to describe him as a loving, permissive father who never punishes his children. You can do anything you want, God is love, and it's fine. If you do that, you grow up with feral children. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but yet, if love without justice ends up with chaos and lawlessness. 
So God is the perfect blend of justice and mercy. So he's somewhere in between. Because today, there's, there's many people who say, oh, God won't ex exact judgment. He's, he's too loving. He, would, he wouldn't do that. And we're going to look at some scripture that shows that God is merciful, but there comes a time when he says enough is enough. So, and we see this, first of all, in Satan being cast out of heaven. And Revelation 12, 7 through 12 says, War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels. But they did not prevail, nor was their place found for them any longer in heaven. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old that called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his, and the power of his Christ have come. And for the accuser of the brethren, who accused before them before God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows his time is short. So we see God was willing to cast Satan out of heaven. Secondly, he, was, he drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. We see the story of, of Adam and Eve and the heartbreak that they felt when they had to leave their home. But God had warned them. He had given them parameters, and they chose uh, not to follow them. There was also the great flood. God had felt that this earth was nothing but evil. We see that in, in chapter 6 through 8 of Genesis. We see that God warned the, God warned the people. He gave them 120 years to, to realize that they needed to make changes in their, in their ways of life, and they didn't. And as they watched that ark being built, it did not change. They knew that God, um, Noah had told them that the flood was coming. I mean, Noah had extended family that, that didn't listen. And it was only eight people who got on, on that ark, along with the animals God sent, that survived. So we see God is willing to execute judgment if, when, when need be. Um, also, Genesis 19 talks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see that at that time, Sodom and Gomorrah became so evil. And they sent angels. God sent angels to, get, to, to have them, them leave, um, to have Lot and his family leave. And Lot didn't want to leave. They waited until the very last minute, until they almost didn't get out of, of Sodom. Jude 7 says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, flesh are set forth and ex as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Then there's the firstborn of Egypt. We see this in Alex Exodus 11 and 12, and I'm going to read to you Exodus 11, 4 through 6. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant behind the hand mill, and the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, as was not like it before, nor will it be again. Exodus 12, uh, 29 to 31, And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the first captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. And then in verse 30 it says, So Pharaoh arose in the night, he and his servants and all the Egyptians, 
and there was a great cry in Egypt. There was not a house where there was not one dead. Then he called Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out and among the people, both you and your children, and go, serve the Lord. And so we see um, God will, in, in that situation, was willing to take out firstborn so his people could be with him to serve him. That's kind of what's what's happening at here at the at the very end. We see Ananias and Sapphira, and we know that story that uh, Ananias and Sapphira had sold all their possessions and they held back some of what they had promised. And what happened? They both fell dead. At, at Peter's feet. And actually, pa Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled you, in verse 3, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the land, of piece of the land for yourself? So we see that both he and his, his wife died. So it's, it's no surprise that there will be an executive judgment of the wicked at the end of human history. 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood to the word of the ungodly, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, and condemned the ungodly. And 2 Peter uh, says in 3, 10 through 13, But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, when the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements will burn with fervor and heat. Both the earth and the works therein shall be burned up. So um, Ellen White says in Manuscript Releases, God's goodness and long forbearance, his patience, his mercy, exercised to his subjects will not hinder him from punishing the sinner who refused to be obedient to his requirements. It is not for a man, a criminal against God's holy law, pardoned only through the great sacrifice he made in giving his son to die for the guilty, because his law was changeless. So we see that the time will come where God will make a decision for judgment for the righteous and for the ungodly. And so fortunately, God is a loving God, and he is, has the right blend of mercy and justice. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God is right. <clears throat> Thursday, the second death. I'm going to start off reading Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. Now, when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. In other words, the entire earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went under, or they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that would be Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And we know that that's not forever and ever. We've covered this before because in the verse before, they're devoured. Devoured means you're completely gone. That is a scripture that we've all read before, probably at one point in time. Short, concise, and to the point. It's almost like, like biblical cliff notes. When the greater light, that's the Bible, doesn't give us the full story, then we can look to the lesser light. And Ellen White writes in The Great Controversy, page 662, Christ descends upon the Mount of Olives, whence after his resurrection he ascended and where the angels repeated the promise of his return, saying, says the prophet, The Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. And there shall be a very great valley, 
and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day shall there be one Lord, and his name, and his name one. Zechariah 14, um, 5, and then 4 and 9 as well. As the new Jerusalem and its dazzling splendor comes down out of heaven, it rests upon the place purified and made ready to receive it. And Christ with his people and angels enters the holy city. Now I understand how the city got there for the condemned to surround in the camp and of the camp of the saints. So let's look at more. In early writings, page 293, then Jesus and all the retinue of angel, holy angels and all the redeemed saints left the city. The angels surrounded their commander and escorted him on his way, and the train of redeemed saints followed. Then, in terrible, fearful majesty, Jesus called forth the wicked dead, and they came up with the same feeble, sickly bodies that went into the grave. What a spectacle! What a scene! At the first resurrection, all came forth in immortal bloom, but at the second, the marks of the curse are visible on all. The kings and noblemen of the earth, the mean and low, and learned and unlearned come forth together all behold the son of man and those very men who despised and mocked him who put the crown of thorns upon his sacred brow and smote him with the reed behold him in all his kingly majesty those who spit upon him in the hour of his trial now turn from his piercing gaze and from the glory of his countenance those who drove the nails through his hands and feet now look upon the marks of his crucifixion. Those who thrust the spear into his side behold the marks of their cruelty on his body. And they know that, this, uh, the, that he is the very one whom they crucified and derided in his expiring agony. And then there arises one long protracted wail of agony as they flee to hide from the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All are seeking to hide in the rocks, to shield themselves from the terrible glory of him whom they once despised. And overwhelmed and pained with his majesty and exceeding glory, they with one accord raise their voices with terrible distinctness exclaim, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So we know that the wicked are resurrected in the same way that they died, whether young or old, strong or feeble, intelligent or dull. All are as they were in life, still stricken with sin and still indignant to God. We read in the Great Controversy, page 663, now, Satan prepares for one last mighty struggle, and this is the true sign of character, for the supremacy. While deprived of his power and cut off from his work of deception, the prince of evil was miserable and dejected. But as the wicked dead are raised, he sees the vast multitudes upon his side. His hopes revive, and he determines not to yield the great controversy. He will marshal all the armies of the lost under his banner, and through them endeavor to execute his plans. He just never gives up, does he? The wicked are Satan's captives, and rejecting Christ, they have accepted the rule of the rebel leader. They are ready to receive his suggestions and to do his bidding. Yet true to his early cunning, he does not acknowledge himself to be Satan. He claims to be the prince who is the rightful owner of the world and whose inheritance has been unlawfully wrestled from him. He represents himself to his deluded subjects as a redeemer, assuring them that his power was brought forth from the, their graves and that he is about to rescue them from the most cruel tyranny. The presence of Christ having been removed, Satan works wonders to support his claims. He makes the weak strong and inspires all with his own spirit and energy. 
he proposes to lead them against the camp of the saints and to take possession of the city of God. With fiendish exultation, he points to the unnumbered millions who have been raised from the dead and declares that their leader, he is well able to overthrow the city and regain his throne and his kingdom. So even though they're resurrected, and now you know why they have to have fire come down from heaven, they just do not change. They are still rebelling as much as possible against the government of God. He's going to fight to the bitter end. What is it? Um, what was that line from Paradise Lost? It's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Now, even though it's a I don't poem, agree with that. But no, but even though that's what Satan says, even though it's a poem, right? That mentality is there. Yeah. And then finally, we look at the great controversy, page 672 and 3. Every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. The indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Upon the wicked he shall rain quick burning coals, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. We get that Sodom and Gomorrah in, image there. Um, horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. And that's Isaiah 9, 5 and 34, 2 and Psalms eleven six. Fire comes down from God out of heaven. The earth is broken up. The weapons concealed in its depths are drawn forth. Devouring flames burst from every yawning chasm. The very rocks are on fire. The day has come that shall burn as an oven. The elements melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein are burnt up. And that's from Malachi 4, 1 and 2 Peter 3, 10. The earth's surface seems one molten mass. So not only will fire rain down from heaven, magma will come up from the earth. A vast seething lake of fire. It is the time of the judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. It's Isaiah 34, 8. The wicked receive their recompense in the earth. They, Proverbs eleven thirty one. They shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up. Say the Lord of Hosts, Malachi four one. Some are destroyed in a moment, while others suffer many days. All are punished according to their deeds. That's what happens during that millennium. This is decided their time. The sins of the righteous, having been transferred to Satan as we talked about in the Day of Atonement, he is made to suffer not only punishment or for his own rebellion, but for all the sins which he has caused God's people to commit. His punishment is to be far greater than that of those whom he has deceived. After all have perished who fell by his deceptions, he is still to live and suffer on. And the cleansing flames of the wicked are at last destroyed root and branch, Satan the root and his followers the branches. The full penalty of the law has been visited. The demands of justice have been met. And heaven and earth, beholding, declare the righteousness of Jehovah. And it is good that they cease to exist. Can you imagine if they had to be like the pain they felt from seeing the glory of God? If they had to do that for all eternity? That would be something. So it is good that God basically destroys them for all eternity. And in the end, the great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness. Throughout the realms of illimitable space, from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love.
That would be my final thought. Thank you. Something to look forward to. Thank you. So the fi final thoughts here uh, are this, as, as, I'm, as I, we, we've studied this lesson. The judgment is a very long judgment. And sometimes it overwhelms me to think that the, the judgment started in 1844. So it's yeah. been going on now for 170 years. And we know that the, the dead are judged first, and very soon the, the judgment will fall upon the living. God's desire is that no one be lost. Amen. And it is, he, he gives us each choices. And we, we pray that our choices are the right choices and we make good choices. And if you think about it, the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Egypt, the nights prior to their destruction, they were rioting in pleasure. They, had, they, they, they weren't thinking about God's vengeance. They weren't thinking about what was happening, what their lives looked like, or what was happening to them. And so as we look at our choices, I pray that we look to God to pour his spirit out upon us, give us strength, give us good choices, and that we totally connect with him because we do want to be in heaven. That is, that is a hope of, of every yeah. Christian. And so just think about, it's, it's, a very, it's very solemn to think about where we are in time and how everything will look like it's going on when all the judgments start hitting. And even earlier, our life is the evidence and our judgment. Mm -hmm. So are we following God and his law and his will, or are we doing our own? That's the question we each have to, to, to search our hearts for. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for this lesson, Lord, we look forward to your soon coming. And we pray, Lord, that our lives reflect you, reflect your character in our lives, that we live as you lived, that it's not about us and what we want and what we need, but rather about what you want us to be doing, how you want us to be living, and how you want to be shared with others. So, Father, we just want to thank you for this wonderful lesson. We pray now, Lord, as we spend this day with you and we think about your birth and the wonderful uh, time that was spent with, with you and the, in the manger and all the shepherds and the angels and the wise men, Lord, that we realize this is a time of giving. And so we just pray, Lord, that we can give in some small amount as you gave so much for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Merry Sabbath. Merry Christmas. And, and have a blessed day in the Lord. Yes, a wonderful Christmas to you all.